archives of Prasar Bharti presents the timeless treasure of golden era. Shambhudat, we hear and we read about you and we come to know that the preparation for your theatre activity began much earlier. In fact, you had novitiated yourself for training your voice, for building your body for decades, even from your boyhood. And you basically wanted to be an actor. Yeah. And we also know from your various sayings and your writings, what is the role of culture, how culture interacts with society. But we are yet to find a statement from you. Why did you really got enamored with theatre? Say with acting. This is something which I myself also don't know precisely. It just happened. Yes, of course, I could have done something else, but... Uh, you could write, for example. Yes, uh, maybe I could have attempted to be a writer. But uh, somehow it so happened that I understood that it was theatre which attracts me most. And uh, actually the bodybuilding part of it is not connected with theatre. It was, we had that sort of atmosphere. My father was also very conscious about his physical, you know. He took regular exercises, etc. That atmosphere was there in the house. So we were taught to take some exercises right from the beginning when we were children. That was there, but that ultimately helped me a lot in the theatre also. And about the training of the voice, it was not really for the theatre. It was because I liked poems. I liked to recite them. And uh, that was, of course, uh, there was somebody else whom I called. He taught me this thing that if you like a poem, you cannot really understand the poem till you read it aloud. And uh, I started reading poems. And reading them aloud, I felt that you need to have a good voice. Good voice means expressive voice, so that the poem comes out. And uh, from my boyhood, when I was a teenager, they said that I read well. As a matter of fact, in the neighborhood, if there was a story, for example, and there was a book by Sharchandra, so they will ask me to read it out to them. Many of them had read it before, they wanted me to read that out. They said that I read it out say, properly, so that the pictures are very living. Somehow that happened, and uh, to be able to create those pictures through the words, that means through the spoken words, you need sort of sensitiveness in your voice. It is not just mechanical modulations. It's something I hope you will agree. It is something a little more than that, a sort of sensitiveness in the voice. And that's how I tried to make those poems living. And that, again, ultimately, drove me towards theatre acting. And uh, at one time it so happened that I felt many of the poems which I had recited before that, for example, Abar Aobhan, Joto Kichu Chilokaj, Shangoto Korichiaj, Dir Kudinoman, that sort of. Suddenly I felt that they were very, very overtly theatrical. And I didn't know that it was the poems themselves were not overtly theatrical, it was my way of reading them was overtly theatrical. Anyway, I started disliking them. And at that point of time, we had gone out of Bengal, we were staying in UP. And uh, I liked the other poems of the God. For example, Duaro Bakiri Jamuni Chakiri Muni Hulu Januchini, that sort of. No? I thought that they were better. They were very, what should I say, honest and important and without any of that theatricality in them. But one evening there, somebody was playing a disc of uh, Shishir Kumar Bhaduri and I think Kankabati. 
a disc uh, from a scene from Alamgir that was being played in the neighborhood. And suddenly my heart thumped. I felt that there was some sort of unimaginable, you know, uh, some sort of attraction. It was almost like meeting one's loved one after a long time. I did not actually follow that sort of acting. It's not that, but it's the very fact that it was the voice of two actors, one actor and another actress. That set my heart fluttering. And then that evening I felt that I am wedded to theatre. But I wanted to be an actor only. Could you remember the year? Most probably that was in 1935. 35? Yeah, or 36. And uh, if we don't call it training, what you had been doing before with your voice, with relation to poems, after this evening in 1935, did something change in your exercises? In personal exercises? They may have, you know, it's very difficult to say about, to say anything about that time, because that was long back. And uh, we normally have a tendency, when we look back, in the hindsight, we put too much of logic in our mm. actions, which most probably was not there. Or perhaps the logic was in a different, uh, what should I say, subterranean sort of way. Uh, which is not that easy. It cannot be so easily simplified. Sometime in 34, maybe in 33 or 34, I had started reading all sorts of books. Bernard Shaw was also there, but I didn't very much understand him at that time. But I had a go at Freud. <laughs> His psychoanalysis and interpretation of dreams, etc. And T.S. Eliot. Yes, a little later. A little later, T.S. Eliot also. But uh, by that time, I have read quite a lot of the English plays. Including Shakespeare? Yes, of course. Um, but a little of Shakespeare, not all of it. And uh, especially it started with, say, plays by Noel Coward. At the same time, I was reading Aldous Huxley. All these things together sort of created in my mind unknowingly, sort of theatre I would like. After Noel covered, I read all the books, or all the plays by Bernard Shaw, along with the professors, mm -hmm. <laughs> and also Chekhov. Toller. Yes, Toller, and that sort of thing. And those things started at that time. So there may be a connection between the two, but when I was trying to be expressive, in my voice. All those things were there. I mean, they were also somehow contributing to it. And Shamuda, what about from that evening in 1935? For our convenience, we are repeating that date. Yes, I was barely 20 at that time. Yes, hmm. from that auspicious evening in 1935. <laughs> did you start also seeing theatre more frequently or if you had not seen much earlier, did you that feeling that you should see theatre? It, it was all after I came back to Calcutta. That was in the year? And that was at the end of 37. 37. And uh, then there was another very, what should I say, a very benevolent God to me, a Dada, Jyotinadda. He somehow liked me very much. He thought that I have got some talents and he, he thought that I was quite sincere. And he was a very honest person very honest persons that I have seen in my life and very intelligent. I mean, none of the, what should I say, intellectual pretensions, pretensions <laughs> that you see, it's not like that. Even when he knew, uh, say, 80% of something, he would say that I don't know it exactly fully, uh, but most probably it is like this. Even when he knew the 80% of the subject, a truly self-effacing cultured person. Really cultured person and very honest and very intelligent. Anyway, he took me to the theatres, all sorts of theatres. And I didn't like, all the time I didn't like those theatres, especially the plays, I didn't like. But there were some actors whom I liked. 
I thought that they went beyond the script. Banality of the text or the production. Yes, they went, uh, what should the much beyond the banality of the play and brought in some, what should I say, very... Essential human experience. Ah, essential human situation. When one is betrayed by one whom he has trusted or she has trusted, that's a sort of feeling which can be expressed in the, with the best of plays. However bad the theatre itself in its totality might be. Yes, yes. Those things came across and they touched me. And that way I found that, for example, Jogesh Choudhury, at Prabha Devi, at Manaranjan Babu, they were remarkable actors. They could go, that they had that range, and they could go and bring out the humanness in all its depth. And that is how I saw the theatre, and then joined the theatre. Now, before that, Shamuda, before Rubicon was crossed, I should say, <laughs> what kind of friends you had at that time, apart from Jyotinadda, your senior? Mainly Jyotinadda. Jyotinadda and another person, Bodda. These were older persons, but uh, they were actually the only friends that I had. This is very funny. I was younger, much younger. Yeah, much younger. And, uh, but they took a liking. And I also liked their company. I learned so many things so easily. And not only that, later I found, somehow inside me, I could see that how a person develops how his own pet dreams either comes to a fulfillment or they get shattered, mostly they get shattered. And how those processes go on in a human being, that I could see, because they were older than me, it was as if I was seeing the whole thing. I mean, from my age to their age, that was a great... Very helpful. Help, very helpful to understand the history of a human development. Of human development and how the society changes along with it. It's very interesting. But this I became aware of much later. Well, Shambhada, if we get back to the earlier point, that when you started seeing theatre, say, from 37, you, as I understand, it was sort of a mixed reaction. I mean, on the one side, the theatre in its totality was bad. The play or the presentation. But some actors in certain situations, they gave you certain things which were very rich for you because you still remember these as mm. your cherished memories. And there were some productions also which impressed me. For example, the production of Digby Jai by Shishir Kumar Vaduri. That was a remarkable production and the production and values impressed me. That I saw much earlier. That was uh, just when I had entered the college in 1931. What I wanted to know actually, what I wanted to know, was there a contradiction in the situation that the theatre which you were exposed to by your own choice, I mean as a viewer, and its plus and minus points, both were definitely somewhat apparent to you. Yes. And so the decision to join that was more difficult. Yes, I actually didn't want to join. It was never my idea of going there because I didn't, that way, I didn't think that there was anything which I could get from there. But as it happened, that a friend of Jyotinanda had come one evening and said, Shambhu do you want to go to a theatre? I know a person who knows Vimu and Roy and he'll be taken it in at Rangmahal. I said, oh, what's to do there? Nothing to do there. There's no meaning going to the theatre and joining it. Suddenly, Jyotinanda said that you talk a lot about theatre to us, we people who don't know theatre. You talk a lot about this. Why don't you go and prove yourself there? And that stung. It was a very healthy challenge and which you'd accepted. <laughs> yes, I accepted it and went there. And uh, fortunately for me, I was recognised. And uh, I was there, I did work with all the important actors at that time and some of them have already written that they noticed me the very first time they saw me, etc. And uh, I have heard a lot about my voice also. 
डू यू नो दैट चारू चंद्र भट्टाचार्य फ्रेंड ऑफ रविंद्रनाथ ही इन हिज बुक हेज रिटर्न दैट देर आर फोर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वॉइसिस वेरी गुड वॉइसिस इन द बेंगोली थिएटर स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम अमृत मित्र देन शिशिर कुमार भादुड़ी दुर्गादास बंदोपाध्याय एंड माई सेल्फ ही सेज दैट दीज आर दोर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट वॉइसिस इन द बेंगोली थिएटर एनी वे दैट्स हाउ इट वेंट ऑन बट द थिंग वॉज दैट डिकटम यू वॉज देयर I was doing there I was doing those roles and I started losing all respect for the audience I mean when they can come and see such plays see me doing such idiotic things anybody all the actors doing such idiotic things and many of them are quite educated people badralogs they come to see and pay their good money good money for that then manaranjan babu had once said that you know how it happens those people are very educated they may be whatever pretensions they may have when they come to the theater they leave their brain along with the part of the counterfoil and then <laughs> with the asha <laughs> goes in <laughs> this is how theater goes on so there it came to a head some no, at that. one point and i left it it's a matter of fact it was called public theater in the beginning um, in contrast to those other plays which were being produced in the uh, gardens of the big zamindars etc babus babus so that way it was called public theater but it was that only theater so you joined this theater and stayed in this theater for some years yeah for about 2 years i think 2 years during Maybe. these 2 years because of your exposure to this theater i mean could we just have somewhat mechanically divided cross section view of that kind of theater for example the kind of nature of the dramas i mean quality of dramas generally being performed there the production or presentational style that was by and large excepting shishir bhaduri's one or two that you have mentioned here and there and the acting general and specific if we could just concentrate a bit on these areas a little it's very difficult difficult in this sense that for example jabbar patel you know mm-hmm. he came here and he wanted to you know document the new the-, the modern theater he called it which according to him starts with say navanna etc from during the 40s i said i don't know i don't understand these nomenclatures when girish babu wrote a play on dowry death way back in the latter part of the 19th century was it modern at that time or wasn't it and the productions that shishir babu did they were also at his time were supposed to be very modern and uh, mostly the cream of the society the elite of the society were very much in awe of shishir kumar bhaduri's productions and his way of acting etc so how do you say that this is not the modern theater and the modern theater started only in 1944 it's not that easy that theater also was modern every time you see any artist reacts to the society that is around him he is bound to and in that reaction what does it do for example when uh, girish babu was doing i think that play siraj uddaula on the stage it has started tilak came there he was slightly late came during the performance and as he entered the box girish babu stopped the play knelt down on the stage did namaskar and then again started the play this very gesture does it mean that it wasn't modern it wasn't aware of the society not only of bengal you mind it is tilak that means that they were aware about the whole indian situation and when this ordinance against the performances theatrical performances were passed it was only because that something strongly or banteringly said against the rulers at that time so that shows that the theater right from the beginning was trying to perform its role 
with relation to the society? But yes, with relation to the society. On the one side, it was trying to fight the colonial power. On the other side, it was fighting the dowry system. Of course, it was they tried to throttle it. Hmm? But now, when you suddenly call the latter theatre as the modern theatre, then there's some be, and I must say that you are t being too blind and egoistical mm. to call ourselves to be the messiah of the theatre. It had started long before that. So when I reacted, there must be a meaning in that reaction. There were things I could understand. The better sort of theatre lineage was there. And at the same time, it was high time that the form changed. Say, for example, after Girish Babu and others, the phase that we call as Shishi Babu's phase, the productions were different. No? They were done in a different way. They looked much more modern. And not only that, the way Shishir Babu ushered in the type of acting, which was called realistic at that time, must have sounded very realistic at and that time. And also the awareness about the decor, yes, decor, costume. Yeah. And the whole theatre, as a matter of fact. All the elements know? getting yeah. into an integrated whole. Cliché that we say, total theatre <laughs> these days. It was like that. He had that understanding. And after him, there were other groups in the theatre, for example, with Shachin Shengupta's plays, Ruthin Bandupaddhai, Shantosh Singha, Rani Bala, Shwashini, they formed a group of their own. And their style of acting was again... Somewhat different. Uh, somewhat different from Kishir Babu's. Sounded much more, more modern, nearer to the contemporary speaking style. But though, that also went of the yeah, track. He has a guilt which made us think that they were modern wore off very quickly. <laughs> it wasn't really very... It was modern. rather contemporary than modern. Uh, yeah, you may say, you may say, I don't know exact uh, English words which can serve our purpose at this time. But uh, in Bengali, uh, I can say that dekhte mune hoto jano khub adhunik kintu ektu pari buche ke lo je adhunik tau jathishto adhunik noi. Shambhuda, for the benefit of our intellectual friends, might we couch your connection with the theatre at that time, in the early 40s, like this, that you were faced with a situation of dichotomy. On the one side, this theatre in its tradition had certain plus points. It had sometimes offered brilliant acting. It had sometimes shown a social awareness of things happening in the All India scale. And... It had certain definite force which would keep the people attracted to this theatre. But at the same time, this theatre was missing something. There was something missing in this theatre. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Since you left it, it was obvious that you were not satisfied. What was this missing thing? I think most probably I look at it in this way. In every age, history or say time, poses some questions in front of the society. And the artists, they try to answer those questions of that age. Whenever they answer for the artists, for example, when they want to answer it, they have to have a format in which they can give those answers, tackle those questions. And the format is never absolute. It is always very much influenced by time and space, I mean the society and the particular time of that society which is there, the contemporary time and the contemporary society interlinked, always influences the format. So it happens that that format, after being created, <clears throat> slowly starts growing calluses. It cannot really react to the reality which is changing at the same time. And that is the time when a newer wave has to come in to break those calluses and to bring out the living flesh you know, and to answer again the questions posed by the later age. This is how I see it. So it happened that this theater, and especially in the case of theater or in this, there always are two different motivations. One is which tries to profit by these mediums, 
try to be popular, try to cater to the, you know, the like entertainment. The populist and the mercenary. Yes, it happens in so many other mm. fields also. And there is another which always tries to tackle the questions from his knowledge with his whole entire existence. With social and individual morality, both. Yes. With his whole existence, he has to answer. He feels that he owes it. He has to answer it. So that way, there are always two lines in every arch. And there sometimes is an overlapping, etc., etc. But then these two are there. In theatre, it also happens like that. And whenever one becomes weak, then the other takes over. And, you know, the populist sort of slogans or the entertainment sort of fairs rule the roost. This is how it goes. It was like that. The whole thing looked as if it has grown calluses. It needed a change to be able to communicate to the people. It failed to perceive the reality, the essential issues of reality, and also therefore failed to mediate with the reality. Yes, and yes, slided again, into entertainment. Maybe it was Just not, not good else. entertainment also. So what happens, the intelligence quotient of the audience gets lower and lower. Because if it is just entertainment, you always aim at the lowest common factor. So it becomes a sort of a vicious circle, yeah. which gets smaller and smaller eventually. Yeah, and that exactly what happened to our theatre. At that time, the audience was dwindling. There were not much of an audience. You know, I have seen plays being stopped. Because only, I think, 20, 20 rupees, rupees or 30 no. rupees tickets were sold. sold. And with that big act, I have seen that. So the whole thing changed when the other theatre came in. May I just also ask that major missing feature in this theatre at that time in the early 40s was the necessity of intellect. Maybe. I won't be so harsh. There must have been something missing. The whole, whole atmosphere looked very old, very ancient. Missing the drive yes, and the yes, life force. The, the life was not there, the vigor was not there. And uh, whatever vigor was there was going in the wrong direction. Tangentially. And, yes, and the important people in the society, they never cared for the theatre. They didn't go to see the productions. And it is also understandable, since in your writings and also in your various discussions, which are not very frequent, <laughs> unfortunately for us, you have analyzed the presentational style of some portions in Shishir Vaduri's productions like Dik Bujai, or some acting in Jimon Rongo, or some portion in uh, Alamgir and all this. Would you say that these flashes of brilliance and honest approach to theatre that was sometimes evident and very creative approach. Was the society also responsible for making these people change into something which they could have been otherwise? There are factors which are also intertwined. It's not just a very formal thing. An artist, for example, of the stature of Shishir Kumar Bhaduri, it may be the case that when he came and he was acclaimed by all the important people, by the elite of our society, then that gave him a sort of fear that if he cannot repeat it again, maybe this also can happen. And when he saw that the most uh, of the theatre criticisms that you would find about him during that time, you will see most of them are just rubbish. Eulogy, yes. It never points him. out that why Shishirvaduri is good. There are little pieces of criticism which really helps me, at least, to understand the greatness of Girish Babu. But right. there is no such writing about Shishir Kumar Vaduri. I have not seen anybody writing to find out the distinctive quality of Shishir Kumar Vaduri. That may have also been a reason for him to, to become let little. go his hold on himself, that may be also one of the reasons. So what happens, an actor, an artist, he feels in, a, in the wilderness. He doesn't know what is it that is good in him, but he is expected to always better himself. I mean, it may be completely wrong for me to say it, 
But it may might be, be also, one of the might be one of the reasons. Quite understandable. Mm. And he started in 1920, about that time, and uh, we are talking even about before two, more even than before decades. he came to the theatre, he was very famous because of his plays in the University Institute mm. and all that. And uh, we are talking about 40s. More than two decades. Two decades, as a matter of fact. And by that time, so many things have happened. The society also has changed a lot. The liberation the 20s, struggle, yeah, the non-cooperation li movement, liberation And the way struggle, it was sharpening up. And mm -hmm. the preparation and, of the war. And there was another very big thing, which people these days do not remember, is that financial crash all over the world. No? The Great Depression. The Great the Depression. Yes, the Great Depression also came here. City people, we were robbing the villagers, the patients. And uh, yeah, I don't want to go into those details. But anyway, that was also a very important factor. And the society started changing again. That time, all these things were put together. And uh, it was a very fast-moving time. And so, Shumada, for nearly two years, you were in this theatre acting. About, yes. Uh, and uh, eventually you found that certain things were still good in it, in flashes. But in the ultimate analysis you found that this theatre was not for you. And so you left it. Yes, in flashes. I mean, when we are talking about these two decades, the production of Digbiju is long before this. Now, when I joined it, it was really a very bad time for the theatre. It was in shambles almost. Yes, it was. And uh, anyway, <laughs> there all sorts of things uh, happened at that time. So that was one of the reasons why I felt that uh, one cannot be... So the essential point of discomfiture or disgust or rather loss of interest for this theatre was that this theatre was no longer committed to its reality, generally speaking. And this theatre was failing to mediate the reality. Uh, maybe something like that. Anyway, I felt, I felt that uh, theatre should be much better. Because by that time I have known something about the theatres outside. I have known something about the post-revolutionary theatre in Soviet, Soviet Russia. Russia. I came to know something about the English theatre, the heritage of the English theatre. I read the plays. So that gave me a different feeling about theatre. I sort thought that theatre could be much more important. A, a reference point to that, in yes. contrast, where are yes. we yes. at this moment losing our yes. grip on such a powerful medium? Yes. So you left? <laughs> yes. And what happened in the following years before no. your laboratory or your one in 1943? Yeah, nothing happened. I just stayed at home and most probably I started writing a play. My interest in theatre was there, but not this theatre. And I was not very clear about what theatre, but I knew that what sort of acting I would like to do. I mean, which should sound very real and modern, that sort of thing. So it was like this. And then uh, Bijan, whom I used to know before. Bijan Rattacharya. Bijan Rattacharya and Binay Ghosh. They came to me and they wanted me to come over to the Anti-Fascist Writers Association. There was some conference or something, I don't exactly remember. So they wanted me to go and to recite a poem there. So I went there and recited a poem from Tagore. Dushamoy, Jodiyo Shandha Shiche Mandamandhare, that one. So I think Vishnu Babu got quite interested etc., etc. So I was invited to the 46th Dharmatala Street and uh, they said that they have formed this anti-fascist writers and artists association. So I can very easily be there. So I went there and uh, there were some sort of theatrical activities there and they wanted to produce a play. They had already done a play which I didn't very much like. I thought that these people do not know anything about theatre. And, uh, for example, the play was there about the queue in front of a coal shop. But that play was in English. And they wanted to do it in English now, just to think of it. They wanted to do it in English? Yes, they perhaps had done it also in English. 
under I, the banner of anti-fascist writers and artists. Or uh, some know. other name, I don't know. I don't remember, but mm. I had uh, heard <coughs> this play. I really never could understand that they thought that they will be talking about the common people and at the same time writing the play in English. Anyway, there were all sorts of people there, and not only them, and uh, they wanted something real. So there was a talk about how to do it, and uh, then I said one day to Vishnu Babu that this is an association of the writers. Now why don't you people sit down and write some plays, which would be much better than going to the bazaar for a play? But nobody seemed to be very much enthusiastic about it, but there was a small nucleus in which Binay Ghosh was there, Bijan was there, myself, and I think two, three others also. So we resolved one evening that we all should write one actor, all of us. And maybe we will fail, but doesn't matter. Let us see which comes best, and then we will do it. In that, Binay Ghosh wrote Laboratory, and Bijan wrote a playlet called Agun. So these two were produced in 1943. And you didn't write any? I wrote something That's which was not good, <laughs> eh? and uh, <laughs> I withdrew it. So we did them, and that was the first time that I was given the charge to produce it, to direct it. And I have never thought about directing a play. I never prepared myself for that. This became very difficult for me. Especially, for example, there was one Dilip Roy. He was doing the main young man's role. I was supposed to be the father of that. In which man. of these two plays? Laboratory. Laboratory. Uh, Agun was produced by Bijan. Uh, this was about the clerk and his family, patient and his family, and this sort of... That had a smack, you know, reality in it, in that small planet. It was very good, Bijan's first, I think, venture into. But Shujata, Shujata is Shuchitra's elder sister. Shuchitra Mitra's elder sister. She is Sujata Davis now. Mm. Now, Sujata was there, Dilip Roy was there, and others were there. And I don't know, I, as a person who had some experience in the Shambhazar theater, call it commercial, call it professional, whatever it is. I don't know how they looked at me, uh, whether they thought me important enough. And I had to be very careful, because before we know anything, we know some cliches. And that cliche is that one shouldn't copy somebody. And that sort of, they don't know that even the budding artists, they go to the museum, and copy the masters for a long time to get their hands. You know, that sort of thing is always there. I have to be very careful. And I somehow found a way out. I thought that how would I like somebody to speak that line? For example, how I, if I were doing that role, how would I do it? Then I thought about the logic of the particular sentence. I mean, the mood, how it will be said. And I explained that logic. And they had to admit the logic. And the moment they had to admit the logic, then the modulation also had to be accepted. You know, that way it went on. And I always kept a batch of people in front, you know, sitting there observing the rehearsal, which always gave me a great help. Because... By their silent rejection and acceptance. Yes, yes, yes. By the, you may say, the social acceptance mm -hmm. and the social rejection. And Chinu, etc. was in that gang. Chinmohan Shanavish. Chinmohan Shanavish. We became very friendly, Chinu and myself. And uh, that is how it went on. And uh, we did that in 43. May I just interrupt some of that? So, you became willingly, rather unwillingly, a director. Yes. Although... You wanted to be an actor. Even today, you <laughs> are more fond of acting yes. than taking that arduous job of directing a bunch of people. What happens if you want to direct a play willingly in our situation, you have to become a little of a teacher. And I feel that this teacherish attitude is very bad. Despicable. It, <laughs> very despicable. It kills you. And uh, that dichotomy is in me. It uh, makes you a guru out of you, which you hate to be. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. and that is one of the reasons why I don't want to be a teacher. I don't want to be a guru at all. I want some 
you know, colleagues, I want some fellow travelers. We can compare notes and do the work and not Achha, just Sambhada, following. Could we dig up a little and find out if anything is there, I mean, for you to state? So that way you tackled your acting company and I believe none of them were was an actor. Yeah, none of them. So with entirely fresh, raw, uninitiated materials who had some commitment to you and who had agreed to abide by your captaincy, that way you tried to make actors out of them for that particular play. But what about the entire presentation? I mean, what went about? Most probably I had... I have seen blockings in the theatre and, uh, I mean, the professional theatre. I had seen how they use their actors, so most probably that has given me some understanding just as I knew the stage, I knew how the curtains are pulled, I knew how the board revolves, and these things I knew, I knew what lights are used. I what knew lights the, are available? What lights were available at that time and what sort of dimmers were available at that time. These things, I mean... The technical sound knowledge about the situation, yes, the theatre space. Which I didn't know before joining the theatre. Right, so. I was eager to learn those things. Could you possibly remember whether, I mean, the blocking, the movement of the actors and their relationship with the space, since you did not work out an advanced plan, a blueprint of sort of thing, but did you go on from phase to phase of the play so that the logic of the play essentially led you to organize the movement. Yes, that is true. The logic of the play and which words are necessary, they have to be projected. That is the basis. That is how very tricky situation is later. Much later, I came to understand these things. For example, in a play like Putul Khela, two persons are talking to each other. Now I have to show their faces with their important lines and they are face to face standing. That means they are in profile mm. for the audience. Mm. How do you tackle it? And these are the things that I learned while working. That they will stand there, you will feel that they are face to face, but make them move in a surreptitious way so that the important moments you see the right face. You can see the expression on that right face, that sort of thing that came later. But in the beginning, it was just uh, groping in the dark. Somehow did it. A minor question. I mean, well, if you remember, while preparing this production of laboratory, did it ever happen that you had thought some particular arrangement of actors or some particular delivery of lines at some particular moment? This was very good. But on the next day or the day after, you thought it was ridiculous and I need to change it. No, it never happened. But the point was that the play was a simple short play. Nothing to, as they say in English, nothing much to write home about. So it was done that easily. And most of the time I was being careful about the other actors and actresses. That's how it was done. Then later, Bijan wrote another play called Jawan Bandi which was done, as far as I remember, on the 4th of January, 1944. And it was there, for the first time, from the stage, I recited Madhubang Shirgali. The first reaction of that was very interesting anyway. So, when doing that, we changed the script a little, tried to bring it out the way. There I thought of the decor. How do you do it? I mean, a village and then the city, where they have come city pavement. The only thing that I could find, because we didn't have any money to build up sets, etc., we put the flats on the, well, the back of the flat towards the audience. You know, you could see the... Uh, ribs and... Uh, ribs and all board, that, huh? yes. That was kept there, and it was a very old flat, darkish sort of dirty, that served my purpose. I thought this sort of thing, well-conceived set of a village or anything, this would perhaps convey the meaning. That didn't really convey, but it did one thing. It focused the attention on the actors. People didn't care to see the flats, the set, and that was a great thing. That helped me. 
And the same year in uh, the winter, I don't exactly remember, maybe in November, we started Nabanno. So by that time I have learned a lot. And when we were doing Javan Bandi, about that time, Vijan started writing this Navanna. When we did Javan Bandi in the Star Theatre on the 4th January, as far as I remember, it was 4th of January, P.C. Joshi, the then General Secretary of the Communist Party of India, had come there to see that show. He liked it very much. And uh, he said that there should be a Hindi translation and be taken over to Bombay Antima Vilasha. Antima Vilasha. Because he felt that people in Western India do not know what is happening here in the eastern part of the country. So it is necessary to make them conscious of that and also to get some money for the People's Relief Committee. So that way a translation was made. A new batch of actors were there. Bijan was working in the Anandabhasar Patrika. He couldn't go. So I had to take his role the patriarch, and uh, we rehearsed and went to Bombay.